from Cedarburg Public Library Radio. Well, one of the pleasures of, of, of being in Wisconsin and being in, in Milwaukee and in Cedarburg is uh, you meet some very interesting people. And, and Rick Rucamora, whose name I occasionally misspell it, and he calls me out on that, but that's okay. Has, Rick has been a constant interlocutor on foreign affairs for almost a decade now, especially on China. Rick was a power systems engineer and he brings a bit of that engineering background as he looks at subjects. He was employed by Cooper Power Systems for 41 years and retired in 2015. China has been a major factor in Rick's career. Rick visited China frequently between 1995 and 2005. From 2005 to 2015, Rick worked and lived for 10 years in China, setting up and managing Cooper's China business and was responsible for the entire Asia Pacific market, which gives him a lot of insights into, uh, especially Southeast Asia. Rick and his wife, Joan, studied Chinese language. And when I say ni hao ma, he knows exactly what I'm saying. He knows its history and culture while in China and has traveled extensively, including two visits to Xinjiang. Rick was as a BSEE, and I always wondered why they called it a BS degree, but since I have a BA, it's a lot, I can see the difference. From Rutgers University and an M a master's in electrical engineering from the University of Pittsburgh in power engineering. Though he lives in Glendale, I consider him an honorary Cedarburg burger. Rick, it's all yours. Thank you, John. And I, I always wanted to be a foreign service officer, but uh, Never, I never quite made the grade, so I ended up being an engineer. <laughs> That's true. I didn't, actually. Realize, I didn't realize that was a, con a, a uh, consolation prize. I actually applied at the University of Pennsylvania. I told them I wanted to be the first ambassador to China. That was in 1967. They thought I was crazy. And, it, and anyway, I went to Rutgers instead in engineering. So... So tonight's topic, everyone, is uh, of great decisions. There's is China in Africa, and I guess the theme of China continues from John's discussion uh, last week. And I guess this this graphic tells it all. China is putting a lot of money in Africa in project developments, and it's got the Western world alarmed about what's happening because they really become their dominant power in Africa. Um, the first Chinese person to visit Africa was a long time ago. It's not new that the Chinese are in Africa. It's a man named Zheng He He was a Chinese admiral that, that sailed during the Ming Dynasty and went all the way to east, the coast of East Africa and got there around 1413. He's kind of legendary, especially in Southeast Asia. There's these mon this monument, I think, on the right is in either in Macau or Singapore. I forget which place, but where I got the photo. But there's several of these monuments around Southeast Asia commemorating his voyages. But the Ming Dynasty decided they didn't want to go out in the world, and they actually burned all the ships after he returned, and and that was the end of their contact with the with Africa and the outside world, because the name Zhongguo, China, means middle of the world, middle kingdom. The next time China was really involved in the world, we have to go forward a whole lot of time, is to the Bandung Conference in 1955. This is the first meeting of the non-aligned movement. And you can see here, this is uh, China was participating and all these other countries were there. And I remember growing up and hearing this sound like it's a threat to the, uh, to the United States. I don't know if it really was, but that's how it was perceived in the news. And it was the beginning of the non-aligned movement. And China, this is Zhou Enlai, was attending in there. And this is Nasser. These are representatives from Ethiopia who were there. And initially it had 29 countries and China emerged as a major supporter of Africa's anti-colonial struggle. Uh, the principles of Chinese foreign policy are quite appealing to the African countries. Non-interference in domestic affairs. So you won't hear Chinese lecturing about human rights or corruption. And uh, 
I guess what in John's measure of foreign affairs, they're the realists. The Chinese are the realists, and, we're, and the Americans are the idealists. Um, uh, they have a strong support of anti-colonial movements, which again appeals to Africa. And China has has a history of also of anti-colonialism. They were col colonized by the British, really until 1949, and one could argue even to Hong Kong today. So they want to get rid of the Western powers in uh, in their controlling their country. And China and Africa share this sense of being victimized by Western powers. So they have this in common and they can exploit this in their foreign affairs. And so they've, they've had a policy really for the length of communist China, really since the Bandung Conference of assisting in African development. This is a long time. And their first big project was called the Tazera Railroad, the Tanzania Zambia Railroad. Here is Zambia which is a landlocked country, and they used to have to export their products through Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and South Africa to get their products out of Africa, out, of, out the, to the coast for global shipments. But uh, the Tazara Railroad was built to solve this problem. And it was, uh, China wanted to, Zambia wanted to export its copper. And so the, with the Chinese help, they completed a, near, a railroad uh, nearly 1,200 miles long in the 60s, they, they started building. It was completed in 1975. And you can see here's the uh, picture of the president of Qu President Kwanda of Zambia and Nair of Tanzania at the uh, laying so-called of the Golden Spike, completing the railroad, which allowed Zambia to ship its copper from its landlocked country all the way to Dar es, Dar es Salaam. Now, we have a veteran... A traveler here tonight of the Tazara Railroad, John Kaska, and I hope he'll tell us a little stories about it later later on uh, when we get done tonight. But one of the uh, one of the things that amazes me when I when I learned about the Tazara Railroad is, is that in the 1960s, uh, China and 1970s, the whole time this was being built, China was in complete uh, utter chaos, inter internal anarchy. It was the uh, end of the uh, Great Leap Forward famine that resulted in the death of 45 million people, around, ended around 62, 63. And then shortly after that, in 66, they plunged into the Cultural Revolution, which is complete chaos. And yet China managed to fund the building of this railroad. It kind of astounds me because, believe me, they were a poor country. Um, China's evolving uh, uh, investment strategy in Africa is summarized in this slide. 1976 uh, was the death of Mao, and uh, with that, China became very inward-looking, and it was a reform period. The Chinese referred to this period from 76 to 1989 as reform. It's reform from the excesses of Mao and the Cultural Revolution, and they really focused on internal development. Uh, they wanted to attract Western aid, Western help, Japanese investment, European investment, and, of course, American investment. This is a, one of many pictures of Deng and, Deng and Jimmy Carter. They, uh, this period ended in 1989 with the uh, Tiananmen Square incident, and the whole world was shocked at the, at the violence the Chinese directed at their students, and so foreign direct investment in China was curtailed at this period of time. And uh, so things changed then, and uh, Deng had to go out and find other friends, so he, they encouraged a so-called going out strategy. China... In the Chinese language, there's lots of these little mottos, and this was going out strategy. And uh, this went from the 90s to the present, and they focused on China with a period of increasing investment from 1989 to the present in China. And uh, this is a, the picture in uh, the upper right is uh, Hu Jintao, one of the earlier prime ministers of, of, of China in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, he, this is him at a, at a forum on China in Africa. So, th so this period of, of investment started as a result of Tiananmen, really because of the isolation China was feeling from the Western powers. So they shifted their strategy to Africa. They formalized their cooperation with Africa in 2000 with a forum on China-Africa um, cooperation and the FOCA and FOCAC, Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. This is a picture of Xi Jinping. He didn't come to power until 2012. So this is going on, this has started in 2000s, long before Xi Jinping was in power. And the first meeting was in Beijing. The loan commitments by the, in this forum from Beijing to China, to Africa has grown from 5 billion to 60 billion. 
And the actual lending in 2016 was 30 billion. And you can see here's a chart showing the uh, the loans going into Africa. Okay. And I, just this as an aside, us engineers like graphs, so I put these charts in. But uh, picture's worth a thousand words. Anyway, so you can see the loans really surged. They actually peaked in 2016. And remember, she was just came into power at around 2012. So this regrew a lot during during his 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 reign. He's still in power, of course, and it peaked in 2016. He really was pouring the money and loan money into, into Africa. But the, these are loans, they're not grants. All the lending is official from government to government, and China's not negotiating with Africa. It's China negotiating with individual African countries. The interest rates are near private market. The debt has grown from 1% of GDP to 15% in 2015 in Africa. So Africa's accumulating a lot of debt, but they're glad to have the money to, to build all the projects they dreamed of. And you can see here's some of the, here's a pic, graphic showing some of the projects so where, where the money is going. <laughs> Angola's Angola's 43 billion, uh, Ethiopia, 14 billion, uh, Kenya, almost 10 billion, and uh, Congo, 7 billion, and Sudan, six and a half billion. So there's a lot of money going all around Africa. These are just the top five. Um, these are some of the projects that are in Africa. You can see there's cement plants that they're building all over the place, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Kenya, Mali, Niger, et cetera. Hydropower plant in Guinea, coastal railways in Nigeria, hy hydropower in Angola, copper mining in South Africa. These are just some big projects. Standard, a lot of them are railroads, standard gauge railway in Chad and Sudan and Kenya and Uganda, and then got more copper mining in Congo and Mozambique. So there's a lot of money pouring into China. And as you'll see in a couple of slides, I'll show you it's affecting uh, my business, which is self-manufacturing electrical equipment. Some of that equipment started going to China, going to Africa as part of these projects. Uh, there's a lot of concern wondering about China and, and mineral consumption. China is the largest consumer of copper in the world. They, and they are trying to secure sources for copper all over the world. And so one, one question that came up in some other, other pr presentations we've done is how much mining is, uh, uh, how much mines of copper, of copper and mining interest is trying to take in control of it. So you can see here this slide, I don't expect you to read it, but you can see here just a few, few places in 2005 and massive invest, investments worldwide in different mining projects mm -hmm. around the world to, cons to secure resources for China's manufacturing. And you can see here the trade between China and Africa, the trade balance is summarized here. China is actually importing more from Africa than they're exporting. And most of what they're importing from Africa is minerals. These are other commodities that they're importing and they're exporting transportation equipment, uh, electrical machinery, textiles, chemicals, and other things. So you can see China, Africa does, does have a favorable trade balance with China, but it's all on commodities. And finally, if you look at copper, Question is, has China bought up all the copper mining? Well, that's not what the data shows. They have, China controls about 28% of Africa's production, but then you have First Quantum and Barrick, I think these are the Canadian companies, and, uh, and then uh, Glencore is an Anglo-Swiss company. So they control about 75% of the world's copper production. And the price of copper right, is very important to in my industry, electrical uh, manufacturing, so I pay attention to the price of copper. It's, it's soaring again. Um, because the world economy is expanding and China's buying up most of the copper. China's also been involved in peacekeeping in Africa. They're taking more of a presence in Africa, and these are some of the, pro the places that they are. They're in Mali, they're in South Sudan, they're in Darfur, they're in the Republic of Congo. So it's not a huge presence, but they are participating with the UN in some of these uh, peacekeeping missions. The other areas that's of interest is, is African students in China. And again, another graph, and you can see just how the number of African students, students going to study in China has grown very rapidly, almost exponentially, since, uh, since the beginning of this, this uh, century. And training has a huge influence on, on relations between countries. If, 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 if students are educated in, in the United States, they learn about American culture and they learn about American standards and American ideas. 
and the same as if they're edu educated in, in China. So, so this is really a, a lo good long-term investment by China in the, because these students come away understanding Chinese technical standards, common thinking, and, you have relation and relationships develop with students that go on to be relationships with the elites. So one can argue that this is an important trend to monitor. Then there's the Confucian Institutes, which where, where they're, they're promoting Chinese culture in Africa. This is a, a Dar es Salaam uh, Confucian Institute performance, both Chinese and African cast members. And these Confucian Institutes are all over the world. There are some in the Americas. I think there was some pressure to close these in, some in the Americas, but they're teaching language for one thing at these places. And there are 54 uh, Confucian Institutes now in Africa. Um, so that's another place where the Chinese are pushing their culture in Africa. Infrastructure is Africa's uh, top priority. Africa has intercontinental trade that's only 15% compared to 70% in Europe. What do I mean by intercontinental trade? If we're uh, manufacturing something in Milwaukee and we want to ship it to Las Vegas and we had a poor transportation system, we might ship it by ship over the Great Lakes and then through the Panama Canal to California and then back to Nevada rather than directly overland. So in, but in, in Africa, they don't have that. They, they have to ship around, around the country using the oceans. They don't have good intercontinental transportation system. So this is a huge development need of Africa. Africa has a huge need for infrastructure to, to accommodate intercontinental trade and, and for power system projects and other things. So China's going out strategy, that's the term they use, uh, encourages the SOEs. SOEs stands for the state-owned enterprises. That's the institutions in China. They were originally, they're all owned originally by the government under the communist system. Now there's many, many private in, uh, enterprises in China. But the SOEs are still have a major force in the Chinese economy, and we had to compete against them, and they're, they're subsidized by the government, or they don't have the same profit motive that private companies have. But the SOEs have been encouraged by the China government to go out and seek uh, markets to apply their expertise. And these form on China-Africa cooperation loans require the use of Chinese contractors and Chinese pro products. So there's a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. a requirement, it's not pressure, it's a requirement that, that all the civil and en electrical engineering design work is done by Chinese engineers with Chinese standards and all the products that they made in China. And this, we had similar requirements with our AID loans. When I started my career, we were exporting around the world on American international development loans, which has similar requirements. So we didn't have to worry about international competition, only American competition to participate in these loans. Well, the Chinese have the same system. So if there's a big project going on in Africa that's financed by the Chinese, you gotta have the product made in China. And this had a significant impact on my business because we were making stuff in China hmm. that just fit perfectly into these projects. And we had the international brand name, so the African countries asked to use our product. Uh, one of the example projects used in the, uh, in the Foreign uh, Affair, the Great Decisions briefing book was this Kenya Standard Gauge Railroad. I guess it's an allegory for Chinese investments. So, so the original railroad was from Nairobi, the capital Kenya, to Mombasa, the major port in Kenya. That was the first leg. There was a second leg to a place called Nabi Shah. It was also completed. And a third leg into Uganda was never completed, or at least hasn't completed, completed so far. So the first section was completed for $3.8 billion. The second section from Nairobi to Nabi Shah was $1.5 billion. This is all funded by the Chinese Exim Bank. Exim means Export Import Bank. It's 90% funded by that. But then uh, someone took a close look at what was going on. And this, the cost of this railroad was much higher than other projects that China was doing in Africa. The president of Kenya went to, to uh, China in 2019 asking for funding for the third. And he was sent home empty handed because of the cost of the project was so high. There's a suspicion that the, the cost was inflated by corruption and the railroad was not profitable and the Kenya debt was a big worry. So China's starting to restrain some of their loan, loan, loan uh, generosity, I guess you'd call it, as the reality, economic realities uh, come, into, come to bear. So debt is a big issue, 20, 22% of Africa's debt is to China. 
Projects must be implemented by a Chinese contractor. The loan terms are opaque. That's where the risk of corruption comes in. And the economic effects of COVID-19 have forced many African governments to renegotiate the debt. And this leads us to the next worry, which is the China debt trap. And I don't know if you've heard this term, but this is circulating in the financial circles. And the emblematic example is, is the Sri Lankan port. Sri Lanka is the island country off the southern coast of India. There was a major civil war between the uh, uh, Tamil population. The, they were a minority population brought into Sri Lanka from India and the majority population, Sinhalese, which controls the government. There was a civil war that was sort of stalemated. The Chinese military supported the, the Sinhalese government and, uh, and brought, the, brought the conflict to a resolution. And as payback, China got, got the opportunity to invest in this port in Sri Lanka. And again, there's a lot of political questionings about corruption and so on, but the, the uh, port was built and then the Sri Lankan government defaulted on paying the loan, so China confiscated the port. And this is what's called the debt trap. So a lot of other governments around the world, uh, like Malaysia is one example, uh, uh, Myanmar is another example, they got very suspicious of these Chinese loans because they saw it as a way that China was trying to take over their national assets. People uh, accused China of neo-colonialism. And an example in Africa is in Zambia, where a power company was taken over by China uh, because the Zambian government defaulted on paying the, uh, the uh, servicing the loan. So there's a concern in Africa that, that if you uh, accept these loans, you could lose control of your assets. But nevertheless, it's really hard to turn down this free money or what is perceived as free money. Meanwhile, there's a concern in China that there's being too generous with these loans and that they're never going to get the money back. And, and she's been getting a lot of criticism from within China about the loans that are going out. So if you notice in this chart, the dark blue line is China's loans to the world, not just to Africa. And you can see they starkly went down starting in 2018 and 19 where the World Bank loans, that's the light blue bars that stayed relatively constant during this period. Because a lot of these projects are not, are not economical. So servicing the loans is a big question mark. And they've been subject to, to um, corruption raising the cost of these projects. Technology and consumer development is another big advantage China has. We've all heard a lot about this company called Huawei. That's how it's pronounced, Huawei. And Huawei is a telecommunications company and they've developed 4G capability, which fits Africa's needs perfectly. And so they built about 70% of Africa's uh, telecommunications infrastructure. And, and you know, the United States has put pressure on African countries to divest of Huawei. But it's, again, it's hard to do that. Huawei has a good solution. The price is right. Uh, and the Chinese companies have a big role in music streaming and other me media. And of course, China facial recognition technology uh, is being promoted for surveillance and uh, policing. Then there's the African Union Agenda 2063. And you may not remember this, but in 1963 was when the African Union was formed. And then in uh, 2013, 50 years after it was formed, they came up with this idea of a policy agenda for the next 50 years. And it's an economic plan, including the dream of making Africa a single, single economic zone like the European Union. I wonder if they're going to reconsider that now, given all the problems the EU is having. But anyway, that was the dream. And uh, uh, also focuses on digital infrastructure and cultural preservation. Well, the China's infrastructure development model is a natural partner for the Agenda 63. That's what it's called, Agenda 63, because China has it all. Um, they, they can do all the, everything is required for infrastructure. They build ports, they build railroads, they build whole cities and factories, and they do it fast. I keep, every time I came back from China, I mar marveled at how slow the construction was on the Marquette Interchange. In China, would have had the whole thing done in six months because they did one right behind my house. It's just as complicated. Um, they have what's called a port park city development model. The port, in this case, is Djibouti. And, uh, and then they, the city was, was Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And they developed a railroad between the two places. So they build products here and export them out through the uh, Gulf of Aden. 
So this is one, one of big one of China, China's big landmark projects in this special economic zone. So, so the Chinese development ideas contrast sharply with the West. We would loan for individual projects. They're, they're loaning for entire, entire uh, concepts of, of uh, project development. And this is a key, a key example project that China's showing to the rest of Africa. The effect of USA China intentions in Africa, China's focus on bilateral relations with individual countries. I said that earlier, and they're not negotiating with Africa, they're nego negotiating with Ethiopia, with Mozambique, Kenya, et cetera. So it gives China a lot of power in the negotiations. And the African countries, one of the requirements is they have want the African countries to support China in the United Nations, replacing Taiwan in the UN is one of the key requirements. There's only uh, one country in Africa that, that is, still has relations with tai, Taiwan, and that's Swaziland. Um, everybody else has, has severed their relations with Taiwan so that they can get access to the, to the favorable loan money from the Chinese. The Chinese expect the African countries to support them in the UN, and, and, you know, a lot of these African countries are Muslims, but they haven't um, said anything about the Chinese crackdown in Xinjiang. So China's been very good at using their diplomacy to muzzle any ch criticism of China in Africa. And the African countries are very sympathetic to China. They feel excluded from the UN Security Council, G7, G20, Bretton Woods, World Health Organization, etc. So they're very sympathetic to China. Energy is a, the other really big one that Africa needs. And China's the place to go if you're trying to build a project. They have the largest coal-fired power generator in the world, the largest importer of foreign oil, China's largest implementer of, of renewable energy in the world. They make all the solar panels that are, a lot of them that are used in the United States. And their state-owned enterprises are under pressure from the government to cut deals to export. So China's building both renewable and conventional energy projects in, in Africa. Hello. And individual countries have, can choose whatever they would like, whatever kind of project they would like. So just a couple slides on what my company was doing in China. All of a sudden, I noticed we were getting all this business in places we never did business before. And Ethiopia is one of the big ones. This is a, a big power station that we, we built some of the what's called power compensation equipment there to make it more energy efficient. Walk into the factory one day, and there's a whole whole delegation of Ethiopian engineers that are working with my engineers. Mozambique. This is a giant transmission project. Mozambique has a lot of hydroelectric power, and they're selling it to South Africa. And they need these kind. Of, this is a different kind of compensation system called a series compensation system. And we built this project also when I was still in China. And then after I left China, there was another project built uh, for ESCOM. That's the National Utility of South Africa. Es ESCOM is star for energy. So they're eagerly uh, uh, taking whatever support they get. And we did a lot of business with ESCOM over the years, one of the few African countries where we did work. But now our products, instead of flowing to the United States, are flowing from China as paid for by Chinese loans. But the other thing is changing though is Africa is becoming more environmentally aware. And this is a project in Kenya that uh, was in a very sensitive maritime area. And there was a growing resistance to coal powered plants in Africa. China has experts, they build so many coal power plants every year. They know that's one thing they really know how to do well. And so uh, their project was scheduled in Kenya and then it was blocked by NGOs in Kenya to block this plant. So Africa is becoming more environmentally aware also. Um, Zimbabwe and South Africa are still con continuing with construction of coal-fired plants. And, and if you're following the news, there's a tremendous power shortage in South Africa right now. So I think they're going to put in anything they can get cheap and fast. And this all is all supported under the umbrella of something you may have heard called the Belt and Road Initiative. It's a $1 trillion U.S. investment outside of China. And this started, we started hearing about this in 2013. This is Xi Jinping's big idea. And we really didn't know what it was. China was really starting to be successful in developing their railroads, high-speed railroads across China. So we thought they were just going to extend their transportation ship system to ship by rail goods across Asia. We, didn't, we, we thought of it as a simple transportation system, and it was presented as a China's new Silk Road. But that changed. Then it became uh, a maritime route developing all these old ports along the old British coal firing stations uh, that went through the Suez Canal to, to Asia. 
And I told you about what happened to the port in Sri Lanka. And then it's turned into being massive development that's all being done and all these loans are all being done under the Belt and Road. And if you remember the graph I showed you earlier, it was 2016. This is really the beginning of Xi's second term when he, when he really started hitting the gas on the Belt and the Road initiative, including investments in, in re rebuilding the port in Greece, Piraeus, and a uh, port in Italy, and a port in, in Northern Europe. So it's really a huge projection of China of Chinese power around the, around the world. So Belt and Road preaches five connectivities, infrastructure, free trade, financial integration, policy coordination, people to people exchange. And most African countries have signed on to BRI and they require, um, be, the first thing you have to do with BRI is you can't be a member, you can't have re relations with Taiwan. And the only country in Africa that has relations with Taiwan is this country, which is, has a new name. It used to be called Swaziland. So uh, Africa is a primary target for, for Belt and Road. It was the strangest thing. I remember hearing it, Belt and Road. E, in Chinese, it's E Dai E Lu. E means one. Dai is belt, one belt, one road. Lu is road, E Dai E Lu. It just seems strange. What does this really mean? But anyway, that's, that's the name of it. So I think the whole world now is aware of Belt and Road and, and, with the, and becoming more aware of what's going on in Africa. And the question is, how should the USA respond? And the Great Decisions book had five areas they suggested, education, debt, services, media, diplomacy, and diaspora outreach, and technology. So education is one key area. We have the best universities in the world. I think it's recognized that way. And we've had more African students coming than we used to have. But, you know, in 2017, we had 46,000 students coming to study in the United States. But by 2017, China had grown from uh, 20,000 to 71,000. Meanwhile, the number of students going to Africa, going to England from Africa and going to France from Africa has declined. So as I said earlier, this is probably one of the best ways to project your ideas is through this, uh, through educating students. I, and, and in recent years, our, the previous administration, I think, was trying to drive out uh, students out of the United States, foreign students. And I just turned it was, off. It was a bad mistake. <clears throat> so debt, debt is a big area. Uh, Africa has an unsustainable debt level. The largest debt is with China. And the opaque ch Chinese lending practices exasperate the problem. These leads to a lot of corruption. And the USA should lead, lead efforts. The, the Great Decision Book is recommending that we should lead efforts to have China conform to global norms of transparency. And this is little, my little note, easier said than done. And a lot of leaders in Africa probably have an interest in leaving things just the way they are. Services is an area where, you have, where the United States has a relative comparative advantage and is recognized, our, again, with our legal firms, our consultants, our research institutes, and uh, we should be aiding societies in trying to drive more transparency and lending. Again, easier said than done. Uh, media diplomacy and diaspora outreach is another area. Our American media is massively popular in Africa. It can be a vehicle for public diplomacy. USA has large population uh, from African countries that are here. I have two neighbors living in where I live in Bayshore that are both from, uh, uh, both families are from Africa. And uh, these relationships have been better that with, between uh, Af Africans living in the United States have been, had better relations and better experiences living in the United States and Africans living in China. Uh, most notable recently was during the coronavirus, there was a lot of discrimination against Africa. Guangzhou is a major industrial city near Hong Kong. It's a major commercial uh, center. And there's a lot of discrimination uh, against Chinese living in, in, uh, living in the city by Chinese citizens. And uh, without, I, all I can say is that Chinese have their own race problems. We're not the only ones who have them. So this is a, 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 black mar a negative mark for China in um, in, in the relations with Africa. Technology is another advantage we have. Uh, China's, China uh, is a major supplier of internet and mobile phones. We're probably not gonna change that anytime soon, but we should encourage uh, African countries to cooperate with other tech sectors. This is again what the Great Decisions book is suggesting, and that closer relationships will benefit the USA and African partners. Just anything we can do to promote relationships would be really, really good. We've been doing business, my company, in some on African projects, both from China as well as from the United States, but majority re and lately have been through at China. 
The Africans also have misgivings about Chinese technologies, and uh, so they're open to other ideas. Finally, I'd like to conclude with this slide here. And uh, this is China's, uh, uh, Africa's perception of China. This is taken by the Council of Foreign Relations uh, fairly recently. And you can see here, the dark green means they have a positive feeling about China, more than 80%, and the light green is 70 to 80%. And even in the brown areas, it's still greater than 50% positive feelings about, about uh, China. So we have our work to do to change that. The, the Chinese, uh, the Africans, uh, we've kind of written off Africa We're, and, our, our, and uh, it's been open season for the Chinese. So that's all my talk. And I, I deliberately made, didn't want to fill up all the time because I figured you all had a few things you'd want to say. So I can turn, I can unshare my screen and we can all look at each other. And, and I put, there's some questions. One of the things I put before I do that, these, these are six questions um, that the Great Decisions book suggested that we could discuss. And I put these questions in the chat. So I'll just go through them really quickly, maybe to stimulate discussion and your thoughts. How has Africa's historical relationship with Europe shaped its relationship with China? Why have the U.S. efforts to stop African cooperation with China been largely unsuccessful? What are the hallmarks of Chinese model as it relates to Africa? What do you think that that the debt will? How do you think the debt will reshape the China-Africa relationship? There's referring to the debt trap. What are the pros and cons of Africans collaborating with Chinese technology companies? What role has infrastructure played in the China-Africa relationship? I hope I answered some of these questions in the presentation. If not, we should go. We should go through them. So I'm going to I'm going to unshare my screen, and uh, we're all here. Rick. Yes. I can't hear you. Can you sorry. No, I, Peter Kranz over here. Just excellent, excellent, really wonderful. I don't know China at all, and it's, always, it's a pleasure to hear this. Um, I was just I just a couple of clarif uh, clarifications. When you s were working for Cooper, were your products then as that were which were being manufactured in China used for projects overseas then as Chinese project uh, products? Yes. Okay, so they so indeed you were you would have had to as you indicated because that, then you were compliant with how they wanted to operate. So it was basically made in China, but they were um, right. they they were coming from joint ventures that we had majority control. Right, right. So you can, yeah, and uh, very interesting. We and we do the same here. You probably appreciate, you know. I mean, if we make it stuff in, in other places, you know, we can. It depends what the content is, I guess. You know, and the content rules and things. A lot of times, yeah. The other thing, just to, I don't know if you saw it, but but there was a there was an article in the um, January February uh, edition of the um, of Foreign Affairs on China and um, what they want. I think it's called. I'm looking at it right now. Oh, send uh, it to me. I'm, I'm not seeing yeah, it. The, it's by a, a, an analyst uh, professor at at Oxford by the name of Rana Mitter. M I T T. -E Rana Mitter. Rana Mitter. Rana Mitter. Yeah. Rana Mitter. There you go. I've read and, a lot of his books. He's an outstanding historian, just outstanding. Well, you would probably appreciate this more than me, but yeah, it's a little bit of not only history, but also sort of the theory as far as he's concerned about, you know, why this this screaming Marxist-Leninist ideological <laughs> operation, you know, has been able to form its position in such a way as to accommodate not only their ideology, but also be able to become, you know, this this monstrously important consumer nation now, without any, without much of a blink, you know, as far as the as far as your your communist leadership is concerned. So anyway, I just I wanted to mention that. Yeah, I'd love to see it if, you, if you're able yeah. to send a copy. I'd love to see yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, good. The um, yeah, you know, the Chinese. Yeah, you know, first of all, I, I, their development. I, maybe people say I don't know. John knows a lot more about this than I do. A whole lot more, but. Apparently, Russian communism was around longer and suppressed whatever entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial instincts the Russians had. But 
China and China's communist reign under Mao was pretty brutal, 1949 to 1976, yeah. preceded by a horrible civil war and world war. But the Chinese are natural, uh, they're just natural capitalists. They, they all like to make <laughs> money. They all want to work hard and make money. Yeah. yeah. So they, they channel that energy. Yeah. As you're, as you're noting, the, uh, the relationship between current China and, and the Chinese entrepreneurial spirit, you can't blame the lack of an entre entre entrepreneurial spirit on, in, the, in the former Soviet Union on the communists. It goes back. It's part of the culture. Politics mm -hmm. trumps economics in, in, in Russia, the Soviet Union, and Tsarist Russia. So the culture is the driver on these things, and that's one of the reasons that Russians and Chinese have difficulty getting along with each other. Uh, 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 interesting. Yeah. Rick, I also noted in that map of yours where you had the um, Afro, it was a piece from uh, Afrobarometer regarding uh, various countries' um, interest or um, favorable feelings towards China. And yeah. just a quick, just, I, just a quick look at it is, I imagine you saw this, but, you know, China was also supplying arms to a lot of those places during their colonial wars, but yes. particularly, particularly in, in, in Mozambique and in Angola, and certainly with respect to the ANC for a while. I remember years ago in college, listening to a BBC interview with Mugabe at the time, and this British reporter thought that he really had him in a corner and he said, but you're receiving arms from uh, communist China. Isn't that true? And Mugabe said, yes. And he said, he said, you know, I've tried other places, but the Chinese were interested in helping us out. I'm dealing with a, you know, trying to overthrow a colonial regime. You know, <laughs> this is that was also but, part of uh China's competition with Russia for Africa. Uh-huh, right. Because right. Russia had more strings attached to their loans and their 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 support of these these uh guerrilla operations. Right. And and I and I thought too that they got in early in the early 60s, you know, regarding Eritrea when Eritrea broke off from Ethiopia and and uh, you know, first it was a relatively sophisticated kind of upper class Muslim Eritrean group, and then the Christians in Eritrea joined them, and before you know it, you know, you had a war that went on until, until the, um, I think the the early '90s there, you know, and uh, but the Chinese brought guys like like Isaias, who's still running Eritrea, and trained him in Beijing, you know, for a long time for for and uh, if not in in North Korea too. I mean, hard, hardcore, you know, sort of new society sort of ideologues about, you know, here's how we are going to make this leap into the modern world. By the way, we have to get rid of everybody above us. And then we're going to sort of lay out our economic and social plan. So. Um, Maybe I should give my, my little Tazara talk right now. Yeah. Yeah. On to, the railroad print. Right. Uh, the, the Tazara is, as, as Rick pointed out, was, was built, uh, because the Zambia, which was a major, it still is a major copper producer, uh, could not get their their uh, goods out, and this is all uh, around the apartheid wars, uh, Black Africa versus uh, White Africa, and the 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 Zambians came went to the the World Bank, they went to the Russians, they went to the UN, they went to they came to us. And none of us felt that that railway was was feasible because it had a bridge, the Rift Valley, and it was an engineering feat that they that 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 the, the experts in all in all of those other organizations said was not feasible. Well, the Chinese built it, and I when I took the trip, uh, we we carried everything we needed for the two days we were on the trip, uh, including. Uh, one case of beer in a cooler and another frozen case of beer in another cooler. And we were very popular on that train. 
and we would, you know, we would, it, 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 we went through the Rift Valley at night. And, and uh, obviously we, I was happy to see that because I, I'm told it is, it's a, uh, it can get your, uh, catch your stomach up in your throat as you're going down, dropping down. I was sleeping. And so I didn't know that. But one of the things that I noticed about Chinese, uh, Chinese projects is the scale of them the grand scale where we don't, we don't do those necessarily. We, we, we have a, a, and you can talk to this better than I, Peter, we have a way in which we look at what are the needs? Where do we plug in this kind of money and big grand scale projects are, are not normally our way in which to do things. But China does like them. Uh, Russia doesn't like them as much as the Chinese do. Is there a cultural thing there on that? Rick, do you think? I think they uh, think big and think fast. They do things fast. People have accused them of low quality in their construction, but I think they've up picked their game up quite a bit. Well, as I mentioned last week when we talked about s supply chains, they can put together teams of 28,000 people in a matter of, of days where we would take months if we could ever do it. I went to a conference with Rio Tinto right before I left China, they were worried about people leaving China. Said so economists from Rio Tinto organized a conference of all the multinationals and I was there as a guest. And there were a lot of guys there from that did uh, a lot of ass rapid assembly electronics and they, exactly what the guy said, I can get a workforce, many thousands of people in an incredibly short time. I can't do that any, in any other country. So we're staying in China. This is when they were wondering if people were gonna start leaving China. Can you project out as, as the as China begins to develop a middle class and a more educated class as to whether or not they're going to continue to be able to deal, to do, to put together those 28,000 teams uh, as quickly as they can, or are they going to be going to s other places like Southeast Asia to do that kind of production? I think they're going to be able to do it for a long time. I think it's in, they're hardworking people. Um, one of the things we, we at one point we had a lot of work we had to do in our factories this is, again right before I left, and um, our one of our factories, a place called Ningbo. I would say I would say about seventy percent of the people were local. You, know, you hear a lot about uh, guest workers, and we were working seven days a week and all kinds of hours. And I, it's being run by our partner, and I. I was worried about labor unrest because we in the United States when we push too hard in the factory we would have labor unrest in this, the Cooper factories. And he just said to me, you know, it's all about money. They'll they'll they're glad to have the overtime. They want to work and make the money. So it's just it's just a cultural thing. Yeah. Well, one of the things Africans told me when I spent my three years in Zambia was uh, when we started. And this was early on in the our environmental messages. Uh, don't talk to us about pollution. We want that pollution. We want those industries. We want those factories. Yeah. I, I would I would think too though, Rick. You know, you had such a tremendous untapped labor force there too for years. You know that wasn't connected, if I'm not mistaken. You know to any kind of um, sort of um, directed, regular sort of industrial production. And so in, in, with the reforms in the 80s, all of these people were able to come in, were they not, and, and just and, and flood that, industri that emerging industrial sector and, and keep your, project, your, your, your trajectory of your GDP growth on this, on this um uh, you know, on an upward slope, certainly. And, um, I, you know, you're probably still not seeing the end of that because you've got so much, and, and it would seem to me that it would, might keep your wages down too since you've got so many people. Uh, but the to wages be able to have been rising them. very rapidly in China. Mm, interesting. That's one of the things we were concerned about. The, um, yeah. the other thing you have in China is a mass migration from the countryside, the interior of China to, to the the coastal manufacturing areas, particularly in the south in Guangzhou. And um, 
that's that's changing. I mean, to your question, I think, I think that does support your your thesis. You know, like Apple moved one of their factories to a place called Zhengzhou. That's in the middle of China. Rather, it's to move, they move the factory to where the labor is, rather than having the labor come to where the factory is. So uh -huh. things are cha things are changing in the in the development model. It's pretty tough, you know. During the early years, we were there. There were a lot of suicides in the in Foxconn factory. Women were in these dorms. They were working seven days a week, and uh, the Foxconn got some really bad press. Uh, the women were jumping out 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 of windows, committing suicide. They actually put nets around some of the dormitories. Oh, God. So. Um, yeah, I think they're trying. They're, they're having. To, they're having to change as with the times. You know, people aren't as desperate as they were. Peter, are you able to see the chat room? I I am, but I haven't. There's a question. I think that you should you could answer from Steve Ruggieri. Is Steve Ruggieri around here? Yes, I did. Where is there? That's a little bird that's sitting down there. <laughs> right, right. And it doesn't oh, look like I, a dove. Steve, Steve, nice to hear. You know, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but um, I, I can tell you that uh, anything that your tax money and mine sent to Africa over that period of time was a grant. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't there, there weren't any loans there from directly from your government. Now, I don't know what the what World Bank put in. So that, you know, World Bank would be putting in some loans and I, um, you could get those numbers, but. Um, yeah, that, but we don't get credit for the World Bank loans. Right, right, right. But direct, you know, U.S. government to to Africa, um, I would think is a, is a pretty significant amount of money. I can't tell you right off the top. I can give you a good website actually on that. Let me I was just looking at it the other day. A lot of, aren't a lot of the loans going through the World Bank rather than directly from the U.S.? No, that's what I was saying. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Our, ours, your money and my money, everybody who's listening to this has money, you know, that goes from our foreign assistance appropriations every year to all, most all the countries, not all of them, but most of the countries in Africa. Well, and one of the, and, and, and Peter and I have talked about this before, one of one of the things that we also do in terms of our foreign assistance is promote transparency, democracy, uh, uh, and civil government, which is something China has no interest in, and mostly many of the leaders in Africa have no interest in either. And so, therefore, we uh, uh, per, the, the amount of money that we're putting into projects similar to what China is doing is is really quite small. I saw when I did the, a presentation on the Philippines, we don't even begin to compare. And if we strip out the democracy promotion materials, where where you can understand why China is making so much progress in terms of its relationship with Duterte in the Philippines. Yeah, where we do beat everybody all the time, and and personally, I'm happy about this. Is in disaster assistance yes. or humanitarian assistance or Absolutely. refugee affairs and stuff like this, you know, right. which politically politically is oftentimes a lot more palatable, you know, to your population than than Absolutely. giving than than giving great big loans, you know, to what some people may consider, you know, to be wasteful spending or indeed corrupt governments and stuff. Somebody asked me just today actually about Central America. They said, why are we putting all this money in Central America? <clears throat> I said, well, first of all, we're not giving anything to Honduras, Guatemala, or El Salvador to those governments. We're giving it all to the private sector or to humanitarian groups. That's where we're, that's where we're, where it's going. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of stuff. And, and, and we used to do these big projects in the 50s and 60s, you know, the big uh, capital intensive pieces, you know, that the Chinese are so, so much favor. But um, they become oftentimes there were simple issues of maintenance over the long term and relatively quickly, you know, in, in places that didn't have the institutions or the tax base to keep these things going they would become white elephants. And then, you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post would say, hey, look at this. Here's where your tax money is going to, right? So, Or the opposition party in Congress. <laughs> right, yeah.
I mean, one of the I made a a, a comment in the uh, chat room that when we were talking about all this money they're spending on the BRI, well, that came from us and a whole bunch of other people who were buying their goods, and this was this was Deng Xiaoping's major thrust and she is enjoying the fruits of that uh -huh. Uh -huh. would you agree rick yeah i think i think the uh the previous you know from dung, from dung dung was more cunning than his successors you know his successors yes. were very focused on business i mean dung had a long-term view and he knew he needed uh outside support development and no conflict with the west and she has changed that 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 uh strategy totally yeah so so well, it's almost like the, th the three phases of post-world war ii china yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mao dang and xi the guys in between were bureaucrats focused on business you know they would have really they would encourage foreign executives to come one of my friends met uh Jiang Zemin, he's an engineer. A lot, a lot of the leadership are engineers in, in China. And uh, he was at an engineering conference and Jiang Zemin was there and he met him. That mm -hmm. was Deng's, basically Deng's successor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any more questions out there? Robert, have you got a question? It's 7.30. <laughs> <laughs> I trust that wasn't Robert talking. <laughs> No, no questions. Um, I, I'm very much appreciating what I'm hearing, though. I'm surprised the Ruggieri isn't in here yet. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that one little question, that's... that's. It was a good one, though. It was a good one. <laughs> oh, he's got bandwidth issues. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you lived in the town of Cedarburg, you wouldn't have those. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Not starting a war. <laughs> and by the way, can we access this, these talks now that they're recorded as well as the PowerPoints? Yes, uh, Jeff will come on. Uh, Jeff, are you there, Jeff? I am indeed. Can you answer that question about how they can ask, access this pro program or tell other people to access it? Absolutely. Um, so the audio is recorded and um, I post it on our podcast page, which if you just go to a Google search and type in CPL radio, I believe our podcast site is the first thing that comes up and uh, you can get it that way. Also, the CPL radio, CPL radio has a Facebook page and I post everything as they're edited and put out on the podcast page there. So basically, it's just on the feed. Um, and gosh, there's so many places. Uh, YouTube, if you type in CPL radio on YouTube, you'll get every single podcast we do on YouTube. Just obviously the audio. A lot of people go to YouTube for audio now. So I'm doing that. Um, it is also on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. I'm everywhere. Right. Right. <laughs> Somebody so, stop me. <laughs> so in that, in that regard, in, and <laughs> regarding a, an opening comment of mine, just for the record. So it was in 2008 when these guys were were taken by Colombian military helicopter in, in, oh, Tuba, see. in Tobogota, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm standing by that anecdote about the six-pack of Lone Star beer, however. <laughs> but it was 2008. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. I, I've got a question for Rick. Rick, you had mentioned earlier in your uh, presentation that with the uh, uh, default by one of the countries in Africa, then the Chinese assume control of the project. Do you think there are now some of these countries are beginning to pull back and have second thoughts about the uh, uh, these massive loans and and uh, maybe reconsidering the uh, the largesse that that uh, uh, China has bestowed on them? I can say for sure that Myanmar and Malaysia both renegotiated projects and loans in a major way. Malaysia kicked out their, pre their prime minister. Um, 
it's Mahathir. I'm losing track of the prime ministers in Malaysia and, and they accused China of neocolonialism and renegotiated all the, all the projects and loans. Basically, the previous administration took a huge amount of money. It was a huge scandal. I think Goldman Sachs got dragged into it or became part of it. Uh, Myanmar negotiated a major, canceled a major uh, hydroelectric pro um, project. I think it was on the Salween River. Uh, in Africa, the, the one that's used as a symbol of it is, is, is this project in Zambia, where the uh, power power project was was taken over by the Chinese. I'm not sure that I'm not sure the Chinese want these uh, want that to happen. I don't I don't I don't see their motives as is that's uh, I don't think that's their motive because you know in the end they'll lose the goodwill of the country the country and the country can always nationalize all the assets. I think they. They, their, their concern, I think, is is that these Xi Jinping has to cover his back, and there's there's people in China in China are skeptical about all the money going outside of China, and that should be used for development in China. It's really not that different than the politics here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think ultimately they would like these to succeed and and control the the attitude of African countries toward, towards China that they would support China, mm -hmm. and then I think they've succeeded in doing that. It's pretty apparent they have. Well, but one of the, these projects, once they get started, take on lives of their own. And rarely do people look at the cost and cost consequences, or they look at the cost possibly, but not the consequences as they, as they begin to. And this didn't start with this massive projection at the beginning. It, 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 it was this step, then that step, and this, they were all added as right. time went on. Well, like the Kenya project, basically the cost of this Kenya project, however the metrics they, me they measure railroad construction came in much higher than the cost of other comparable projects in Africa. So they didn't, they didn't finance the third leg of the project. They sent the guy home empty handed. As a criminologist, I would have looked at the way in which that happened as, okay, this project's gonna cost more but where is Kenya in terms of its relationship with us? Are we willing to ex, ex and and the I I don't think the 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 question of corruption is one that bothers the Chinese in terms of what they're doing outside of China. I mean the corruption thing. Well, the corruption things in China are more political control than they are actual corruption. For sure, for sure. Uh, but. As, as they look at a place like Kenya, is Kenya slipping and moving closer to the United States or moving closer to someone else? Yeah, perhaps, probably. I, I don't know, but, and I'm not aware of what they changed. I invited a Kenyan woman to come, but she didn't show up. So, I guess she forgot. Yeah. We could have gotten the inside scoop. You know, an interesting question on this with all the $143 billion that China has laid out for loans to Africa as to what kind of return on investment are they getting? If, if they're primarily doing this to secure their raw material supply for their factories, um, why not just not do that and just buy it on the world market? I mean, what kind of return on investment are they getting? I don't think they think like that. They don't think like we do. I've been involved. I was involved in a major way in a project in uh, in Brazil, China bought the whole Brazilian transmission. Not the whole, most a big chunk of the Brazilian transmission grid was purchased by China in around 2010 to 2012. And the part of the terms was they had to upgrade the transmission grid, so they were buying all this compensation equipment from us. And Brazilians, you know, re standards required them to use equip equipment that was favored us, our American. Equipment. Now, some of it was made in China and some of it was made in, uh, in uh, the United States. And the whole project was in U.S. dollars or the stuff in the United States was in U.S. dollars and the stuff from China was in renminbi, which is pegged to the U.S. dollar. In the middle of this thing, Brazil had a ma massive, more than 50% reduction in, in the real dollar exchange rate. And the Chinese took a huge hit on it. They didn't blink an eye. They just completed the project, and they never came back to us once and renegotiate the price. I was shocked. So there's another, some of something else driving all this. It's, it's Rick, 
Rick, yes. one of the things that I took away from my experience in Russia and the Soviet Union was that politics trumps economics. Yeah. Is that true in China as well? I'm having trouble answering that question. Yes, and I guess yes and no. Okay. I mean, the Chinese businessmen want to make money, and they're really they're, they're ferocious I'm competitors. I'm talking about the government. The government, the state-owned enterprises, most of them are losing money. So that would you know that their requirement there is to maintain employment. So they take the loss to maintain employment. So I, and right. I think the, I think the measurement for these international loans is foreign relations, favorable foreign relations. Where it, do you have any idea where China's sovereign fund is in terms of the size of it today? I have no idea. Because that becomes an indicator as to how long they can carry this on. Well, they also have this you know, huge favorable trade balance with the United States. And that, where does that money go? Is it going into treasury yeah, notes? and other into that they're sovereign trying, fund. They're trying to diversify it now. But I, don't, I think it's not so easy to do. Well, it unleashes it unleashes other kinds of tensions within the society. If you begin to spend more domestically, you're raising the standard of living. You're going to be raising expectations on the part of the people as to what's next. What's you know where am I and how do I fit into this game? Mm -hmm. Well, we're five minutes before they tell us that the library is closing. Uh, to remind everyone, we'll be on next week. Uh, Doug Savage from the Institute of World Affairs at UWM will be talking about the Pers Persian Gulf security. China is not particularly involved in Persian Gulf security at this point, but we'll probably have some sort of a footnote and, and Rick can bring it up in, at least <laughs> in the question period. Uh, a reminder that you need to sign up each week for these, top, for these talks. Please let other people know that they're going on. Uh, the more people, the better. And Steve, that bird is really starting to get to me. <laughs> so thank you very much, Rick. This is, this is a virtual applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yep, you thank very you. much. Yeah. Great. And the last one, two weeks from now, Peter Cranstover will be talking about globalization with a question mark. And China is very much part of that. Try to do my best. Okay. I uh, put the link to the CPL radio podcast site in the comment sec in the chat section. So if anybody wants to uh, click on that and add that as a bookmark, that helps me too. Very good. <laughs> makes, makes me look good. <laughs> all right. Great. Great. All right. Thank you all. For Thank you. Us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Okay. Good night. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, everybody. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Adios. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. Take care.